Something is amiss in Bayport, the Hardy Boys' hometown. First, there is trouble in Shantytown. And then a strange blue craft tries to ram Joe and Frank's boat, the Sleuth. That night, the local bank is robbed. And later that same night, the young detective's pals, Chet Morton and Biff Hooper, mysteriously disappear after a masquerade party. Are the events related? And do they emanate from Shantytown or from Hermit Island? How the Hardy Boys use all their courage and skill to outwit the criminals provides an exciting climax to one of the most baffling mysteries the young detectives have ever encountered. Okay, is is this some sort of, like, Chinese yeah. warlock thing? Yeah. Like, it seems like they're describing a Fu Manchu. The slanted eyes. The slanted eyes. And, like sl- and the long nose is weird, but... That, yeah. yeah, odd combo. Like, why, I didn't, why not just a top hat and some white gloves? Welcome to the Hardy Boys Drink Book. I'm Charles Webster. Each episode, I'm going to sit down with writers, actors, and comedians to talk about a book in the Hardy Boys Mystery Series. We'll kick back with a signature drink, solve a few mysteries, and we're a culturally insensitive magician outfit. This episode's drink was created by Joe Phillips at Sputnik, the bar next to the High Dive Music Venue on Broadway in Ellsworth. Today's drink has gin and mezcal and is sure to put you into low Earth orbit. This is the Hardy Boys Drink Book number four, The Missing Chums. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hardy Boys Drink Book Podcast. I am here today with actor and my regular co-producer and my brother, Jack Wefso. Finally. Finally, Finally. I'm here. Yes. And and I think you might have the best book so far, which I say every time because they just keep getting better and better. They just keep getting better. Quick note about the Hardy Boys. The Hardy Boys were originally written in 1927 by Franklin W. Dixon, who is better known as the inventor of space drills. The books were heavily rewritten in the 1950s to make them less racist, uh, more PC, eliminate some of the more awkward... CD elements? There are some CD elements to it. Yeah, Um, with characters with names like Baldy Turk. Baldy Turk, yeah. He doesn't make it into this edition. Doesn't make it. So, uh, we're using the new editions. Uh, And you have your bingo card. I am so excited about this bingo thing. So, we are doing bingo. Uh, Every time an event happens in the book that is on the bingo card, things like going to school. I have, yeah, Mrs. Hardy leaves the house. Explosion, that one's got an exclamation point. Explosion's good. Pie has an exclamation point. Yes. I feel like we can jump in at, I mean, the book starts in one of the most ridiculous ways ever. The chief of police calls uh, 17 and 18 year old boys into the police station and he's got a new case for them. He wants them to dress up in disguises and go down to Shantytown, which is a squatter's colony at the edge of the, on a little like island off the edge of the bay. No, it's on the, it's on the beach. It's just outside of Bayport and it's got a great description where they, they say, uh, well, I just like this whole thing. All right. I'll get right to the point. There's something funny going on in the squatter colony at the end of the bay. You mean Shantytown? Joe asked, referring to a settlement of shacks on the ocean shore north of Bayport. The odd community was composed mostly of men who had seasonal or temporary jobs, and some who did not work at all. And I actually thought that maybe this was Chief Colleague being confused, because he sends the boys. Basically, there's been a lot of fights breaking mm-hmm. out in the squatter's colony, so he wants the boys to go down there and hang around around Shantytown. Yeah, around a bunch of these basically homeless dudes and find out why these homeless guys are fighting are each fighting other. Are fighting all the time. I think that Chief Colleague is confused, because in the first book, their dad disguised himself as a homeless man and went to the train yard and got a bunch oh. of information, ended up finding Red Jackley, that whole thing. Yeah. I think he just forgot that that was Fenton Hardy and not the boy. <laughs> this is just, or he just called, or maybe like, like Frank's voice has started to drop Chantry's and he answered like, the phone and was like, Hardy residence. And immediately, like, I got a case for you. I need you to dress up as that. Come down to the station. Come down to the station. We'll talk about a click. And then they came down and, and, and they were like, what do you want, chief? And then the chief, and, there were all these other officers standing and he's like, I want and, you to go down to Shantytown. Oh. oh. So they go down to get their boat. Yeah. This is the moment right at the beginning where we meet Chet and Biff. Yep. Chet, the stout food loving boy, and mm-hmm. Biff, their lanky boxer friend. I also, so it's called The Adventure of the Missing Chums. I also refer to it as The Adventure of the Too Many Boys. Yeah. There are a lot of boys yeah. in this. Yeah. There's Frank and Joe, there's Chet, there's Biff, Biff. there's Tony, Tony there's Pino. Jerry, yeah. and then there's the two girls, Iola and Kat. Uh-huh. And, and I think they and there's some, even more in the original. There's, and there's more kids that they meet at yeah. the costume party later. Yeah. Oh, they go out on the ocean mm-hmm. and they almost get rammed by a boat. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're, so, yeah, they're out on their cruise and they're like, oh, they, look, they, they're shanty town. They're mm-hmm. kind of looking at it from the water. Yeah. 
Yeah, which I'll get back to later how I, for all of these that I've read, I could not draw you a map of Bayport. No. I, like, geography makes no sense. But they're in this bay, and, yeah, they see Shantytown. And then there's a regatta. There's all these sailboats that right. are sailing, and they're kind of watching the regatta. And I think they get distracted, and then they notice yeah. a boat kind of bearing down on Coming them. Coming right at them. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, tries to ram them. They get out of the way. Yeah. Um, later, we learn that it was a test. Yeah, which was weird. They go back and... Att- oh, yeah. And then we find out there's a costume party. Yeah, there's a masquerade comes out party of nowhere. tonight. Yeah, exactly. They're like, better get back before Callie shows now that a our, costume yeah, party. Yeah, now that we almost died and, you know, yeah. and everything's fine. So after their near-death experience mm-hmm. on the boat, they go back into town to go to Mr. French's costume shop. And I really... Mr. N- French is back. I never thought this really character would, would come again. back. I thought he'd end up in jail or something. But yeah. uh, Oh, but he... Yeah. So Mr. They, French has a hard road ahead of him. They they see that Mr. French is being like harassed by some, by, some by, guys, some, by some guys. Some, who then uh, pretend to be friendly with him, but they see right through it. And then those guys leave. Yeah. And they have a perfect opportunity to be, say to Mr. French, like, hey man, were what those was guys on? threatening you? What was that all about? Do you about? want us to tell our dad? Yeah, any of those things. But they're, but they're, he's they're just like, like, give us our costumes. Here's your costumes, boys. And he's like trembling and like they're looking like, at the door the whole that time. That was weird. Yeah, and they're like, thanks. Yeah, and then they leave and they're like, they that get was a suspicious. gorilla costume and a magician costume. Which you can cut this if you want to, but sure. I'm going to read the description of the magician costume yeah it's because a little offensive why is this a magician costume is my suit ready too mr french joe asked after the men had passed from sight uh, y- yes the magician's outfit here it is the shopkeeper opened the other box and held up a rubber mask with a long nose sinister slanting eyes black mustache and goatee joe looked at it for a moment with approval then returned it to the box. Okay, is is this some sort of, like, Chinese yeah. warlock thing? Yeah. Like, it seems like they're describing a Fu Manchu. The slanted eyes. The slanted eyes. And, like and the long nose is weird, but... That, yeah. yeah, odd combo. But, like, why, I didn't, why not just a top hat and some white gloves and a little waist cape? <laughs> I, I don't know. No, it's the most racist, so generically racist magician costume yeah, that you could get. Yeah, so then after that, they go home, and then they get ready to go to this party. But So they go home, and they have dinner. Then they go, and they get some ice cream to take to the costume party. After they pick up the ice cream and load it on their motorcycles, they witness a bank robbery, chase after the robbers. The robbers get on a boat and go into onto the ocean. The boys go to get the sleuth, but the sleuth has been stolen. They it's, also run to the Coast Guard office oh, they get the before Coast Guard. they call Tony Preto. That's right. Run all the way down the block, inform the Coast Guard what's happening. Right, the Coast and the Guard starts to, yeah, the Coast they, Guard starts to mobilize. They call Tony. Yep. Tony comes and meets them. They get on the boat. They go out on the water. They come within feet mm-hmm. of catching the sleuth, but right. it's pitch black because it's the middle of the night at this point. So and, and it's summer, so we know that it's got to be after nine thirty. Exactly. And there's a really, really thick fog. They don't find him. They don't find him. Oh, and that's another thing. They come up on the beach, and a cop who doesn't know what's going on draws yeah. a weapon on them mm-hmm. and is like, "You boys, freeze. get down on the ground." Yeah, they're not uh, wearing their costume. Costumes yet? Oh, but right. He, he thinks that they're the robbers, and then he he makes them stay while he searches the car. He finds their costumes. Mm-hmm. It's already been reported that the bank robbers had wore a gorilla costume. costume. Yeah, had yeah. a gorilla costume specifically. Then after that, they they go, go home. home. They talk to Fenton. They talk to their mom. Then they go to the party, and yep. they get to the party, and the party still is in- just rocking, man. And Callie's like, "Hey, let me put that ice cream in the freezer." That ice cream is just gone. It's, it's done. It's, it's milk. It's, it's like cardboard in the bottom of the motorcycle bags. container. It got jostled on the motorcycle. It was sitting like right over the gas tank probably. You know. It's <laughs> easily been three hours exactly. since they bought it. But yeah. then all of a sudden Frank shows up and Chet had earlier said my costume would be a surprise. His costume is the same costume that Frank is wearing. As Frank's is. They're, he's just also They're both gorilla. gorillas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so it's just a normal party scene and then everybody's going to go home. I assume like Frank and Joe like made out with Callie and Iola. And yeah. Like, I mean, it's like a high school yeah, party. Yeah, they leave and then I think it's like Biff and Chet are like, well, I think tomorrow we're going to go out early and do their camping trip. That's sort of like the tie oh, into this, yeah, yeah, yeah. to the original plot where they say like, we might go out early and go camping. You kind of think that the Biff and Chet would love to go on a camping trip without the Hardy mm. Boys. Where like they get to make the fire. Yeah. You know? And they get to just like relax. Exactly. And not, they don't have to be explained how to set up a tent while they're setting the right. tent up. Right. They hear like a bang in the distant forest and they're like, huh, what was that? Don't I know. know. <laughs> and they and then they just go back to sitting there. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And so the party breaks up. Frank and Joe go home. Chat's going to give Biff a ride. And this is the moment where I think all of our hundreds of hours of watching Forensics Files takes over. Yeah. Because they get home and in the middle of the night they get a phone call mm-hmm. from Chet's mom. 
asking if they know if Chet's staying at Biff's. Right. Or no, if they know where Chet is. And they said, oh, he might have stayed at Biff's. Yeah. Because they were, because they left the party together. Mm -hmm. And then Biff's mom calls and is like, do you know where Biff is? Right. And they're like, well, they said they might go camping. It is the middle of the night uh, because he calls Callie and he's like, hey, is Chet's car still out front of your house? Mm -hmm. They go and investigate the queen and they don't find any, there's no problem with it. It starts just fine. So they know that something's happened. At this moment, I have seen enough Forensics Files and Unsolved Mysteries to be like, Chet and Biff are probably dead. Probably dead. I don't know what they saw as they were leaving the party or who, who, or who they ran into or uh, yeah. yeah, all of the signs. Yeah. Like all the warning bells are going off. In Absolutely. my mind, I hear the forensic files music and then the voiceover being like seven years later. Right. As exactly. The... Boom, doom, ding, boom, boom, ding, ding. All right. Well, that's time to yeah. check in with. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Uh, what do I have here? We saw the queen. I and have the, the queen sleuth. Fenton Harding. Oh, obviously. disguises. It's a masquerade party. Yeah, absolutely. No treasure, no picnic, no explosions. So the next uh, morning... Yeah, the next morning they go out looking for the sleuth. Yeah, they, um, they, they... It's a combination of them looking for the sleuth and looking for Biff and Chet. Right. The state police are searching too, Mr. Hardy told them. A lead may turn up before the day is over. I hate to mention it, he added. But the boys might have been kidnapped bum, bum, so bum. to be on the safe side there'll be absolutely no publicity good idea frank agreed for a minute he and joe sat in glum silence what about the sleuth joe asked finally oh the coast guard hasn't found it yet mr hardy replied there are no leads on the bank robbery either how about the stolen car okay guys no 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 chet and biff have been kidnapped like like screw the property okay we'll find them after Though, the people. that's a big part of this is that it's fairly early in the book where they say it's just that we, we have, have so many, many mysteries. mysteries to solve and that's how i felt as the reader i'm like okay is this still shantytown because this book started i want to remind our listeners they were supposed to go to shantytown they were supposed to go to shantytown find out why people were fighting it was a really nice setup. And then it just takes this right-hand turn into sailboat races and masquerade balls and missing people. And, yeah, it's a yeah. lot It's a lot to follow. I'm just going to say that. They eventually get their boat, and they decide to finally go to Shantytown. Yes. Oh, right. Uh, Shantytown. Shantytown, remember? And they get these sweet beachcomber disguises. More I'm going to... costumes. These are high school-age boys from a upper-middle-class family with probably... Good teeth and skin. Yep, absolutely. Um, they look like two entirely different looking young men. Frank's face was smudged and his dark hair was tussled. He wore a battered straw hat and a striped jersey with a long rip in the back. That's Joe's right. normal suntan had been made even darker by the use of makeup. A fake tattoo decorated his right arm. His trousers were torn off at the knee. Like, if they go into a group of, like, seedy characters, the first thing that's going to happen is one of them going to look at him and be like, Is that makeup? <laughs> you know? <laughs> And I like this because they, they show up in Shantytown. They're like, we're just going to ask a couple of questions. And they walk into Shantytown and the very first person that they're like, excuse me, turns around and is like, what do you want? And pulls out a blackjack. Black yeah, and goes to like crack him on the head with it. So this guy's going to beat the hell out of him with a blackjack. And they get saved by Dolph Lundgren. Oh, Dolph frickin' Lundgren. I mean, it's spelled slightly different in this book, but yeah, it's totally... It's Alf Lundgren. It's Alf Lundgren. But in my mind, I'm like, no, it's Dolph Lundgren. Yeah, except I have a lot of questions about how old Alf Lundgren is. And I'll... I'll they I'll, describe I'll... it as like him as a young man, but I just think it's just Dolph Lundgren. In, yeah. In, in, like, in his prime. Yeah, oh, but totally. But dressed as a beach But as, Yeah. So Dolph Lundgren, uh, he saves them, and then they... Before they part company, though, with Alf, right? He tells me... Dolph. Dolph, yeah, excuse me. Before they call it part company with Dolph Lundgren, he says, I gotta go see a fellow. You look out for Hank Sutton when you go back. If he tries anything, just let yell for Dolph. Dolph Lundgren. The young giant's friendly act and his open face made Frank decide to trust him. Maybe we can help you sometime, Alf, he said. Our name is Hardy, but we don't want anyone in Shantytown to know it. Okay, so are they in disguise or are they not in disguise? Yeah, they're asking around Shantytown and they're not asking questions like, Where's a good place to get a bite to eat? Yeah, anything like that. What they ask is like, have you seen two missing teenage boys down here recently? One's real fat. Just wondering as average beachcombers like yourselves. Do you know my dad? So they sit around the campfire with all these rough looking men because they're supposed to stay out there. They're like, did anybody got any food? Who's ready to throw in? And they're like, oh, we have some food. Picnic. As the men began to serve themselves on tin plates, Frank and Joe reached into their bags and took out the food they had brought. 
They unpacked a pound of frankfurters. Oh my god! Rolls, two cans of beans, and, and apples. apples. Yeah. Help yourselves, Frank invited cordially. Looks good, boys," said the red-faced man whose name was Lou. Important. Most of us are hungry enough to eat two suppers. That's suspicious as all hell. Yeah. Why'd you boys come out and, like, you're giving us all your food? Yeah, that's weird. Like, also, a pound of Frankfurt. Like, this Where'd is one you of those, get that? This is one of those classic Hardy Boys moments where it, it's like, oh. Had they been carrying this the exactly, whole time? Exactly, where it's like, oh, I'm feeling a little peckish. Surprise! <laughs> Full course meal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're not even trying. At this, at one point, okay, so they go to throw some fire in the fire, and they find the sleeve of Chet's... Gorilla costume. Gorilla costume. Which is another classic. That's a Forensics Files moment, man. You found charred clothing from the victim's body? In a fire. They're dead. Dead. They're dead. They've been dead for like two weeks. This is one of the ways that you know that like he's not trying, they're not even trying to be in disguise. They pick this thing up and they're like, where'd you get this? And they're like, it's just some junk I picked up. It's the sleeve from Chet's gorilla outfit. Are you in disguise or are you not? What are your characters? Our characters are Frank Frank and Joe. Frank and Joe. Disguised (laughs) as speech then after they yeah so they then give, they give they have an update to the police then they names, go home. they go home mm-hmm. and Fenton Hardy's awake when they get home yeah he's up oh yeah he's not going to be asleep I do want to say I know neither of us are parents but if your high school age children yeah. were spending the night working for the police in a squatter investigating colony, a, yeah investigating a kidnap you of you would some not of their be classmates. asleep absolutely either. not absolutely no, you would not, not. be asleep. well you wouldn't let them go no no i wouldn't let my kids go to that i'd be like no. i don't care that the chief of police asked you specifically i'm a detective i'm gonna sue the city <laughs> exactly. is what i'm gonna do exactly this is child endangerment and it happens over and over again <laughs> fenton does way worse later oh absolutely he does so they get the next day they're talking about how if the men if chet and biff have been kidnapped they should get a ransom note in at some it. point yeah but instead they get a postcard yep the hardy boys get a postcard that's like an old postcard, clearly mm-hmm. sold a while ago. Yeah. It's like, we're having a great time. Don't look for us. Biff and Chet. Yeah. And it's mailed in an envelope. It's a postcard, postcard mailed in an, in an envelope. It's another Forensics Files thing where you're like, those boys are dead. Those boys are dead. Yeah. Who's doing this? And exactly. like, both of their parents get... And Snotty Ann Gertrude has a moment here where she says, having a wonderful time indeed. Everyone worried sick. Police searching all over the map for them. And they're having a wonderful time. Yeah. So they go up to Northport. They go to this candy shop, which is owned by a foreigner, right? Well, you know, he's he's described as swarthy, and this might be the first time... And he speaks in broken English. Yeah, and this might be the first time where I actually, like, it kind of occurred to me as a naive reader that perhaps swarthy was a euphemism for dark-skinned. Oh, uh, no. That just happened? Yeah. So, you know, that's a little that's a little sad. From there, they go to the boatyard, and they find the guy who owns the the boat that tried to ram Right, the black cat. Yeah. And he gives them... Who apparently has his hand in a lot of pots, which we'll talk about later. He really owns a couple of businesses. He owns several businesses and boats and a gorilla costume. Yeah. That's the same. That's the exact same. It's actually a coincidence. Yeah. They say, oh, that's a coincidence. And I'm like, yeah, right. I bet that comes into play later. There are... That is the first red herring of what I think are actually two or three red herrings in this book. The best red herring happens right after this. It's my favorite moment in any of the books we have read so far the hardy boys make a huge mistake they're out on their boat they see a they see like a little clipper like a like a you know moderate a modestly sized sailboat yeah and they think they see chet they're like yeah that was joe cried out that was chet that was chet so they kill the engine it's the middle of the night yeah and they coast up silently behind it. They tie, they lash their boat to it. Then they grab a, a rope ladder. I love this. This is my favorite part of any of these oh. series. Joe reached the top of the ladder, stepped forward. Suddenly, out of the darkness, two powerful arms seized him in a vice-like grip. And a man's sandpaper voice called out, Here! I got one of them! And then there's a, there's a whole fight. At one point, I think Joe punches a guy, like, really hard in the stomach. And solar and, plexus. Yeah, and doubles him over. Yeah. Another guy grabs... Frank and Frank's like Chet, Chet, but the guy, guy like tries to grab mm-hmm. him, so Frank like throws him off. Yeah, and basically Frank and Joe beat up a bunch of people. Yeah, they on jump this. onto a boat that has nothing to do with anything they're doing. Fight the guys on board, and when the guys start like, to overpower them, yeah, they jump off. Yeah, they just swim abandon ship again. A completely pointless exercise. No, it had nothing to do. And no, that was one of the things that made this my favorite book so far in the series. Is that this is the book where the Hardy Boys are wrong. Yeah. They have a hunch, and they follow it up. It is incorrect. And then they commit breaking and entering. Assault. Assault. 
And then I don't know what fly to the scene of a crime. <laughs> uh, I guess. Yeah. Also, and then they go home and they tell their family about it, and they're like, "Oh, uh, oh man, our mistake." Also, nothing like that never gets reported to the police. And I would have been like, "Pull up the anchor. We're going back in right now." Somebody is out in this bay trying to board boats and screaming, "Chat, chat!" I guess that's their war cry. <laughs> chat, chat. <laughs> and, well, and then they get home. They tell. They talk about this. The hilarious boat mistake, oh. and they find out that Dolph Lundgren has been arrested. I think now is about time to check yeah. back in. So yeah. there's been picnic. I know there yep, was that. Absolutely. Wait, is a trash fire dinner time at a hobo camp considered a picnic? They unload a pound of frankfurters, rolls, rolls, yeah, it's a picnic. apples. Yeah, that is absolutely a picnic. I have a picnic too. Oh, there was a red herring. The boys, the boys went, left Bayport. They, they went, went to, to Northport. Northport. All right. Dolph Lundgren has been arrested. They find out that he's been arrested, their friend from the from Shantytown. They go and give their word, and they're like, he's been accused of stealing some fancy radios. Yeah, exactly. He's been accused of stealing. Whatever. It doesn't matter. This is one of the things where he starts to get to the point in the book, about halfway through, where there are so many plot elements. It's just that we have so many, many mysteries, mysteries to solve. And I can't keep track of all of it. I the radios li- didn't have anything to do with anything. They come out of nowhere and it's They're just... bank robbers, right? Yeah. Why are they smuggling radios? It's a ring of thieves. It's, it's not a... just oh, no, bank no, no, no. robbers. They're an international ring, ring of thieves. Ring of thieves. And they're like from located San Francisco. on the... Yeah, but then they have contacts in Japan. I couldn't follow it. I, I couldn't either. It's like as uh, maybe... I thought the mystery was fights in Shantytown. And then I thought the mystery was, was missing chums. Because the title of the book is, you know, The Missing the missing chunks. chunks but apparently now it's the case of the japanese radio dolph lundgren has been uh, arrested arrested uh we're holding him in a cell until i talk to you boys the officer explained they're like no he was nice to us once he is above reproach yeah he can't be the bad guy because we were gonna get beat up and, and he, he said he no. saved us yeah exactly so he is right. now a good guy forever um but okay so so he's in the cell and this is frank and joe talking to chief colleague well, I don't believe Dolph's a thief, Frank said. But he does have a record for petty theft and disturbing the peace, Chief Colleg said soberly. That makes it look bad for him. Well, how long ago was that? Joe asked. Dolph's last brush with the law was five years ago, Chief Colleg replied. He claims he was just a wild kid at the time. Okay, so they're like, no, he couldn't do it. And he's like, well, he's got he's a record got a- of exactly this. Petty theft. <laughs> But the boys stake their reputations on it? Absolutely. Their 16, 17-year-old reputations? And shockingly, it pays off. Yeah, and the cops let him go. When when they let it, he's like, all right, I'm going to let you go, right? And Dolph Lundgren says, well, thanks for sticking up for me, boys. Now I'm going to go back to the beach, and I'm going to beat the crap out of Hank Sutton. And then Chief Collig says, hang on, you'll be back here for assault if you try that. But since they back up your story, I'll let you go. And then Dolph Lundgren walks out of the jail. I never see these situations with the police going the way they go with the Hardy Boys. Exactly. In my mind, the Hardy Boys show up and they're like, we arrested this guy. And what happens is they call off the search Mm -hmm. for Chet and Biff. Yeah. They accuse Dolph Lundgren of the rape and murder of Chet and Biff. Uh, He goes to jail for the rest of his life. The Hardy Boys' testimony is conveniently lost or burned or or, 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 or discounted. They never get the chance to testify. Exactly. And Dolph Lundgren uh, gets put to death. by the state. And Chet and Biff are put to death because... Because they're totally useless or sold into human trafficking mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it's not until like 20 years yeah. later till Netflix does some documentary, does documentary about Dolph Lundgren. Dolph Lundgren where you find out that, that Dolph Lundgren was innocent. There's no time. way he could have done it. No. Yeah. He wasn't um, even there. But they had him in custody and that's all that matters. Thank God for Frank and Joe though. Yeah, exactly. Because they they're test- there. <laughs> yeah. So Dolph Lundgren is let go. Mm-hmm. He just takes off. He's like, I'm going to beat the hell out of Sutton. Yeah. And the cop's are like, you better. Well, maybe don't do that. Maybe don't do that. And then he leaves. That night, it's yeah. the middle of the night. I don't know where Frank and Joe sleep in the house. They clearly share a bedroom Yeah, as teenage boys. Which is weird. Um, the boys are asleep and they hear this soft rapping at the door. Yeah, it's not even like a, it's like a timid, like, like a, like I, a, I don't yeah. And they go down to check it out, and they open the door, and it's Mr. French from the costume shop. Yeah. Clearly terrified. Yeah. Who's really surprised to see them. And I thought this was something totally different. I think whatever's happening, he's trying to get close to the boys. Yeah. Because as soon as he sees the boys, he panics. And he runs away. The next morning is when they find out that the guy who tried to beat him up on the beach, the guy who clearly framed Hank Dolph Lundgren, Sutton, yeah, Hank who Sutton, framed, who framed Dolph Lundgren. He's been beat 
to hell. They discover him, like, in a shack on the beach. They like, call the police. An he's inch from co- death. Yeah, he's covered in he's blood. Got, yeah, he's, he's, like, hemorrhaging. Black eyes. Yeah, exactly. And he keeps repeating, I, Dolph Lundgren. Dolph Lundgren. Dolph Lundgren. So Tony and Jerry, they they run into them. Tony makes this comment. He's like, it's really been boring since Chet and Biff have been gone. And I'm like, it's not dull. Are you kidding me? There's bank robbers and yeah. crap. But yeah. they're about to go out to Herman Island and they run into Iola and Callie Sean. Mm-hmm. As who, they're loading up their boat to go look and for they're like, Chet and Biff. Could we come with you guys to look for Iola's missing brother who might be dead? And that's why I wondered if Joe ever checked in. Right. There's no point where he calls her or goes to her house. Yeah. And, like, lets her know he's on the case. Yep. Or anything. He just ex- assumes, like, oh, right. Yeah. Girls. I guess so. And in a case of it's just so many mysteries we have to solve. They're out at Hermit Island and they discover, like, a little camp. Mm-hmm. And then a guy up on a cliff with a shotgun, does he fire it? Nope. He, he just, just sort of They're just kind of looking around because they see... It talks about how they climb and they get into just kind of like the the rhythm of the climb and they start to kind of ignore what's happening. And before they realize it, Callie and Iola are like way behind them. Because they're in pencil skirts. Exactly. And like little button-up blouses. Right, exactly. They're also, they're girls. They're so, girls. And it's 1958, so obviously they're not good climbers. Girls can't do anything. She screams after they drop behind and then she points up and they see... A wild-looking old man with a long, dirty white beard was pointing a shotgun at them. Wow. I'd scream. This line, I really like. Uh, they So they get scared off by the hermit, and they're riding away in the boat. And Frank has noticed from a distance, from the distance yeah. of the guy at the top of the cliff and them at the bottom, that his shotgun was very well cared for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what kind of microscope. Using my telescopic eyes. Yeah. Uh, so... Joe says, there was no nonsense about that gun. I'd like to know what the man's trying to keep us away from. Maybe he just wants to be left alone, Callie suggested. After all, he is a hermit, added Iola. Yeah, that's kind of their yeah, thing. Yeah, that's, that's what hermits do. It's a whole thing. Right, but then we very quickly find out that he's not the real hermit. Because no, apparently there's a yeah, real hermit. They go to talk to the cops and they find out they're like, that hermit died and yeah. they brought his body back. I don't quite remember how they come to this conclusion it's like a narcissistic hardy boys conclusion but they decide that biff and chet must have been mistaken for them yeah and i don't remember there's no connecting dots here yeah it's just like they okay oh they over they go to the costume shop yeah they decide they're like like, well oh it's about time to check on that we're out of leads on this particular one so let's check a video game side quest yeah exactly like a bethesda game mr french we We will will see. Oh, I have the stuff in my inventory to contact Mr. French. But they go to his shop and it's closed and they sneak around back and they overhear them talking about how, like, not a second mistake. You will get them this time. Yeah. But, But it's very vague. Joe's eyes widened with excitement. Then the kidnappers are the bank robbers. And yeah. that, And they would still be out to get us. They know who the bank robbers are. They know that they're the same people that kidnapped Chet and Biff. Right. And that they were the ones who were supposed, who to, be were supposed to be kidnapped. Yes. I love this. Their plan is, well, let's let them kidnap us. Literally exactly what Frank says. We'll let them kidnap us. And Chief Kotlick says, that sounds kind of dangerous. Which it sounds super dangerous. Yeah. But then he lets them go through mm-hmm. with it. And Frenton Hardy gives his permission as well. He's like, yeah, sounds cool. He's like, absolutely. Well, first he says, I don't know if it's plenty risky. And then Joe says, please, Dad. Oh, okay. And then like, all right, I will let my son this get is a kidnapped man, by an international ring of thieves. This is a man who bought his two teenage sons a speedboat. Exactly. For not even their birthday. A man who sent his own sons to look for drug smugglers. Yeah. So they, they're like, oh, I like this. So they go to the costume shop they bang on the door and basically they're like hi turning ourselves into the kidnappers yeah and then and then the boys come in and they do a mutual game of taunting each other my favorite one of these is when the criminals say to them what do you think happened to those missing friends of yours and the two boys go they must Must have have drowned." drowned but they get tied up and they're like all right and now the cops are coming and now this is exactly how it's planned to work out and now my dad is coming getting picked up Getting and carried now, outside the building, but the okay. cops are any minute now. They're going to be here. They're go- dumped inside they- a trunk. I'm dumped inside. We're trunk in is closed. Cops will be here any minute. Cars. Loaded on a boat. Car is starting up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it goes on and on. And the cops and their dad never, never show, show up. up. Never show up to rescue them. They like they actually were, get kidnapped. They got kidnapped. Yeah. And 
they realize eventually that the cops are not coming. They've been tied up there in a cave. And they decide we have to break free ourselves. So they like get left with one guy. Yep. They do the classic, go up to a loose nail. On the yeah, road. they're tied up with uh, in chairs with their hands behind their back. Right. There's a loose nail sticking out of the board. They get all back to Shantytown, by yeah, the way. Yeah, they get all the way back to Shantytown. Yeah, yeah. Finally, we return to Shantytown. They get out of their chairs. Okay, yeah. So they're tied up and there's a like a, a nail. Sti- sticking out. A big out. nail that's like sticking out through the side of the wall. So, uh, so Slice, Frank yeah. hops his way over to it. And then he rubs the, his wrist on the nail, eventually cuts that. Slicing his, up his hands. I'm sorry, I would slice the sh- crap out of my hands. Yeah, absolutely. And also, once he gets his hands free, he reaches into his pocket and pulls out his pocket knife, which he uses to cut his ropes and Joe's ropes. They tied those guys up without And pocket. didn't empty their pockets. They, like, frisked those. They Terrible didn't criminals. Frisk Not yeah. the worst thing these criminals did. Exactly. Uh, they get in a fight with the guy who was guarding them. Yeah, they do another punch to the solar plexus. Mm-hmm. And he goes down, and then they tie him up in the exact same chair, assuming he won't escape the exact same I, way. I think Frank punches him really hard in the solar plexus so hard that the man faints. Yeah. Which which can actually happen. Sure. And then even Joe is like surprised. He's like, wow, that was some punch, Frank. You, you knocked him out. <laughs> and I'm like, well, from the last episode, we learned that he better wake up within the next 15 seconds or he's going or, or to have, have some serious brain damage. It's bingo time once more. All right. The boys got tied up and no ghost. Oh, man. If there was a ghost, if I'd there, have a bingo. I am one, I, if all I need is a secret code and I've got a bingo. Mm. Uh, let's see. There were multiple fist fights. Yeah, so the boys manage to escape from the shack. They tie up the other dude. They eventually do run into the police. And Fenton says, it made me so angry at Fenton. He says something along the lines of, like, I knew you boys were going to get captured, but then I decided the last second not to fuss them up, but to follow them and see where and they see, took you. And see if I could get more of the ring. Yeah. No, the plan was they get kidnapped, the police and their dad storm the kidnappers, they hold them at gunpoint, they make them tell them where the... But instead, Fenton was like, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Wait, 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 more are probably coming out. Why couldn't he at least keep them up to date on the plan? Yeah, well, because... Tell them ahead of time. You'll get kidnapped, they'll take you to the place they're keeping the other boys, we'll follow them. Right. But yeah, I think it's pretty scary to think that your dad's coming to save you and then suddenly realize that... And then he doesn't. He's just not going to. So then they get home, and three shared a late supper of cold chicken, milk, and apple pie. And then they go straight to bed. They're not sure what they're going to do. They're not sure which way they're going to go. they got to go sleuthing. Yeah, they're, they're at breakfast, and they are got to go sleuthing, but they're not sure which way they're going to go. And is that when Dolph visits? Because they come home, and Dolph, Dolph is in, and, and, and their aunt, Aunt Gertrude, is very concerned about the guy in their living room. And yeah, exactly. And I'm like, oh, I kind of understand why... Aunt Gertrude was a little concerned. Right. I mean, he's he's been described as like a very large man. Yeah. Who well, has Dolph a Lundgren. Who, yeah, who has a violent history and plays the harmonica. After they talk to Dolph, they learn more about the criminals. They go back out to Hermit Island. And as yep. Tony says, no girls this time. They find a cave on Hermit Island. They start exploring the cave. They find out that somebody's been living there. Mm-hmm. And then Tony, for all his talk about how useless girls are, Tony falls down a hill Slips, and... Slips, rolls his ankle. Also, they completely comb the entire island like they... It's they, a small island. I thought yeah. it was larger. Yeah. They described it as much larger earlier, but then mm-hmm. they comb it in like an hour or so. Right. But he like hurts himself bad. Like, yeah. They have he, to put him over their shoulders. In fact, I would is, describe this as an actual injury. I think you're probably right. One of the things about Tony that I have to say is that... I have broken bones, and I have twisted ankles. Yeah. I did not react the way that Tony did. Tony lays, and he smiles peacefully. Yeah, he's game. He's very game about it. I think and he he's says like, he remarks gamely yeah, at Yeah, he's one like, point. hey, fellas, sorry about that. Seems to be my ankle. Can't stand up, though. And they're like, why don't you try? Here, put some weight on it, Tony. And then he can't. He falls down, and he's like, oh, my bad, fellas. <laughs> no good, fellas. No good, fellas. And by the time they get him down to the boat, he's like white. He's pale. And yeah. they're like, are you all right, man? And he's like, no, no, I'm okay. I'm I, uh, my ankle's just starting to hurt a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then they split up. Joe and Jerry are going to go on one boat. Frank mm-hmm. and Tony are going to go on the other. But Joe and Jerry end up getting cornered by the criminals and get stuck on yeah, the island. Yeah, exactly. Because, first of all, they escape the criminals fine. They're all in boats. They yeah. get on their boat and they're almost about – they're following Frank and oh, Tony. Oh, Jerry. And then, and then they watch the other boat and it sails like all the way past them completely silently. It sails out of sight like into the little cove on the island where the robbers are parking their boat. And then – Freaking Jerry, man. No, what happens, I remember it very specifically. Kerchoo. Sorry, fellas. 
I'm allergic to pine. Be quiet. They either heard you or they didn't, Jerry. Right, exactly. But they did. And Joe and Jerry end up captured. And Frank and Tony are headed to shore. And Frank yep. realizes the boat. And he's like, I'm going to go get the cops. I'm going to take Tony to the police ambulance. Yeah. Also, I have to say that when Tony and Frank arrive back at shore and the police ambulance is there, that is the first time that you actually see an appropriate police response. Where, like, they right. get there, the entire side of the of the cove is covered with police cars and sirens. The chief is going nuts. He's on the radio with people. There's hustle and bustle everywhere because four boys are missing and, like, there have been gunshots fired. Have there been gunshots fired? I can't remember. Yeah. But at this point, like, we finally see crisis-level police force immediately to be squandered. Yeah. Because then Frank is like, my friends are out there, my brother, I gotta go out and help. And they're and like, Chief lead the like, way, Frank. Lead the way. Yeah. Exactly. They're not like, whoa, 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 son, get in, we've got professionals for this. They're like, everybody, follow that 17-year-old boy. Follow that 17-year-old boy. boy. Yeah. They head out onto the ocean, and at the same time, Joe and Jerry are being confessed to, yeah. I guess, by these criminals, and they confess that their plan was that they found out over the radio that Fenton Hardy was investigating their bank robbery. Yep. So Why they... did they report that on the radio? And then the criminals decided to kidnap the sons of the man investigating their bank robbery. To get him to call off the to case. To get him to call off the case. Nothing is going to motivate a person Absolutely to investigate Absolutely not. Like, I have trained my entire children. life to get a certain set of skills. You know what I mean? Right, like, exactly. <laughs> that guy is going on a rampage, the likes of which haven't been seen hey, so since we... the last time Frank Miller wrote a Hardy Boys book. Hey. Oh, God. Like, <laughs> Franklin W. Miller. <laughs> His That's going to be great. Also, he does not work for law enforcement, so is not really technically bound, bound by, by any of their, their regulations laws. or anything. But yeah, let's mess you with that. Just... That's like that's like being like, you know what? I okay. think that Bruce Wayne might be Batman. Let's kidnap Alfred. I'm going to kidnap Alfred. So the criminals shove them to the back of the cave, and they find trapped in the back of this cave is Mr. French. Not Chet and Biff, but Mr. French. The guy who owns the costume shop. That this poor, poor man. This poor child loving man. man. Well, but he seems okay. Frank takes the cops. He takes them back out to Hermit Island. Back out to Hermit Island. Yep. Where they're going to rescue the boys. As Joe stepped forward, Chief Colleg clamped a hand on his shoulder. Hold it, the chief ordered. Let the armed men go first. Those crooks are desperate and won't hesitate to use their guns. Reluctantly, all three boys heeded the order. At Colleague's signal, Parker drew his service revolver and led the men into the narrow rock corridor. Suddenly, there became an ear-splitting crack! A gunshot from up front! Okay, if they're in a cave, ear-splitting is not the description for that. No. That is like, I am blind and deaf. Thankfully, Lieutenant Parker tells them not to return fire. At the end of the passage... Their hands tied, stood Chet and Biff. Okay, thank God the police did not return fire. No. I see them, like, tied to They're stakes. being used as human shields. Exactly, they're like, human shields. Yeah. yeah. And behind them were Stark and Pops, a cloud yeah. of gun smoke above them. Yeah, then they tackle the guys who were using Chet and Biff as a human shield. Guys they, with weapons. Guys with weapons. Guys that many police officers are pointing guns at. Yeah. Right now. You know, and like, and they Nothing just, to lose. And, and I imagine that the police are just looking at like silhouettes of all this stuff with like a light behind it. And then all of a sudden there's a big commotion and like, and none of those cops open fire. Like if three people had accidentally fired shots. But they succeed. They rescue Chet and Biff. Everybody's okay. Yep. That's the end of the mystery. Yep. So we got some pie. Uh, we had some pie. pie. There were some secret codes. Absolutely. I have a bingo. You are the first bingo of the show. <laughs> I got a bingo. Do you have uh, anything you want to plug? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ode to an Ode is coming up on uh, July 25th at a library in Boulder. Mitch said it last time he was on. Great. Um, you, can, you can look it up. Ode to an Ode presented by Bunport Theater. Uh, also, Siren Song will return in uh, October of this year, and we're very excited about that. All right. Well, thank you, Jack. Oh, it's been a wonderful oh, time finally. having you. And finally. I'm sure I'll have you back shortly. Yeah, maybe I can guest host them. Each episode, we have one of our favorite bartenders mix us up a signature cocktail to sip while we read. The drink recipe and pictures are available at hardyboysdrinkbook.com. Check them out and enjoy today's signature cocktail. Hi, everybody. I am here with Joe Phillips at Sputnik at Ellsworth and Broadway. It's the 00 block of Denver. Uh, Joe, why don't you tell me a little bit about Sputnik? So Sputnik opened about 
14 years ago. It was the satellite bar for the High Dive, which is next door. They first opened up the High Dive, and then they opened up Sputnik. The High Dive is a classic Denver concert venue for those of you who are not in the know. Yes, it's uh, you can see a lot of great shows and drink a lot of great drinks. Just get down and dirty at the High Dive. And then if you want to class it up just a hair, come next door to Sputnik. Do you ever have any Russians come in uh, demanding, like, you know, state secrets or, or, you know, passage out of the country or anything like that? Not yet. We, we have had crowds of Russians come in to drink here thinking it's a Russian bar. Demanding to meet the president and his family. Offering, offering to meet the president uh, with some dirt. I love it. I love it. We, 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 we let them in, but we don't talk about anything. No, and if anything would have come of it, you would have told somebody about it. So, what's the drink you're making for us today? I will be making a drink called the San Jorge. I named it the San Jorge because it's a gin-based cocktail with a mezcal twist. There's a lot of mezcal twists going around. There is. Is everyone else doing this? No one for this podcast has done any mezcal. But every bar that we've gone to, somebody has talked about a particular drink on their menu that they're trying to do something with mezcal. So When I first started bartending, there was a belief that you don't really even mix mezcal, yeah. that it's not even meant for cocktails. And I respectfully disagree. I think there are some things you can do with mezcal. In this one, we're just getting a tiny little float. It's literally just a tiny little bit on the top of the, uh, on the cocktail. That sounds great. And you said this was a twist on a drink you had in Chicago? Yeah, I had this drink that was mezcal, gin, and there was some ingredients that I didn't have back here at Sputnik. So when I came back here, I had to improvise, change some things, and I think, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I think I improved on the original. Oh, that's very good. I can hardly tell it's a gin base, but that's one of the best signs of a perfect gin drink, is that you can't taste the gin, unless it's a martini, I guess. It's a lot sweeter than I thought it would be. But I guess that's the agave nectar. It's bright. It's fruity. The mezcal gives it a nice burn. I like that. It tastes quite boozy. <laughs> yes, it's got a, got a burn on the back of that. All right, that's great. So tell me about your new place. I, you're opening a new place. Yes, I'm opening up a new bar slash vegetarian spot down in historic downtown Inglewood, 3047 South Broadway. Uh, it's going to be called Fellow Traveler. We bought the property. We're just waiting to get everything done. So we could be waiting six plus months. Uh, so be patient. If this podcast is kicking in six plus months, the week you are open, we're going to come in and demand an interview. And you're going to say, we do not have time for this. Oh, I'd love it. I'd love it. Come on in. Well, thank you so much, Joe Phillips at Sputnik. It was such a pleasure to have you on the show. The Hardy Boys Drink Book Podcast is produced by Jack and Charles Wepso. Our music is provided by Danny Overby. Special thanks to Joe Phillips at Sputnik, Kristen Hallstrom, and Taylor Trask at their network. If you have any comments, thoughts, or drunken fan theories, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter and at hardyboysdrinkbook.com. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. And join us next time for Hunting for Hidden Gold.